Hi, welcome to Get Used to It. I'm Sheila Kuehl, and I guide you lovingly through our hour-long show. Um, today we have a, a very special cast of characters because uh, recently people have been flocking to a wonderful movie called uh, The Kids Are All Right. And this uh, show is about how the kids really are all right. I have three guests on my show today, all of whom were raised by members of our gay and lesbian community. Well, actually, I'll leave it to you to see if you think they're all right. Uh, my guests today in the order in which they're going to speak, Carl Cade. Uh, welcome, Carl. Thanks. Carl used to uh, be uh, staff to a member of the LA School Board, uh, worked building schools, and is now working building malls, yep. which can be very educational. Exactly. Uh, so <laughs> we all spend a lot of time with him. Very happy that you're here. Great. Tia Kearns is in school, but she's in the uh, LA School for the Arts. Los Angeles County High School for the Arts. High School for the <laughs> Arts, an actress, and not even an aspiring actress, but a real actress. And I think that's wonderful. Welcome, Tia. Thanks. Emily Gold, who um, <laughs> was on my staff, actually, when I was in the, uh, the Assembly and the California Senate, an incredibly good staffer, and for the past couple of years has been super mom a parent of an almost two-year-old young man named Lucas. Welcome, Emily. Thank you. Carl, let's start with you. This is a, this is a story about um, people who were raised by lesbian people or gay people because outside in the world, there's just a lot of talk, and especially with the Prop 8 trial, mm -hmm. uh, about whether or not our kids are better off, worse off, uh, normal, um, you know, warped, whatever has happened to them. So uh, tell us a little bit about your story so we can at least know where you came from. Sure, sure. Uh, well, I'm 32 now. So I was, my mother's decided to have me in the late 70s. Um, I think really at a time when not many uh, lesbians were really thinking that the, having a child on their own um, was really a possibility. And I, uh, um, you know, came came into this community. It was just sort of figuring out um, exactly, you know, how they felt about kids and and um, how they could remake motherhood in a way that was, you know, empowering to women. And and so I think there were a lot of uh, ways in which uh, my mother sort of figured it out as they went along. Um, they had been activists, and so everything about the way that I was raised was very intentional and was very connected with their broader political values for the world and. So, and while I really respect that now, it often seemed really uh, quaint or precious or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> ambitious. You know, the way that we're going to make oatmeal this morning is going to make you, a, you know, a more socially just person in the world. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, felt you know, kind of hilarious as I grew up. And uh, I would realize that, I think, more as I grew up. Uh, tell us a little bit more about your, your mothers. One was your biological mother? Sure. Yeah, my biological mother, uh, Kathy. She um, chose to have me, and she um, used uh, artificial insemination, donor insemination, uh, and and uh, really had me on her own. Uh, but of course, you never really have anyone on your own, and so she had a, a strong network that included um, a woman that she had been with many years earlier, who was my godmother Ruth. And um, you know, these two women, certainly Kathy, my my primary mother, and then Ruth. Um, went on to each have long relationships with women who also um, raised me. And so um, while I'm sometimes known as two moms, Carl Cade, I, I also get this name of four moms, Carl Cade. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I have a, a strong bench uh, in the parenting department. Um, so um, most kids when they're little, like, uh, like Lucas is now, for instance, sure. it, it doesn't occur to them that they're in a family that may not be exactly like everybody else's family. As a matter of fact, virtually all of us are raised in families, probably not a whole lot like other families. But um, was there a moment or a time in your, you know, little person life when you began to get the message that maybe there was something different about your family? Sure. I, uh, you know, I, I think one thing was that there were so many things different about my family um, that figuring out the piece of them being lesbians and separating that from them being vegetarians or them being in, in the community that I grew up in, college educated, um, was, it was a constant puzzle as a kid to kind of figure out which of those things um, was in play at a given time. And, and, and also over time to figure out, it, it wasn't clear one time when I would be more advantaged 
you know, because my parents were educated, for example, or you know, had a PhD or something, or on the other hand, um, what may have been a subject of, of some sort of discrimination because my mothers um, were lesbians. And so I think there's that way as a kid, as, as a young kid who's just coming into consciousness, where you're sort of still figuring it all out. And, you know, all of a sudden, and by the time you're seven or so, you start to maybe really start kind of putting it together. Um, I think definitely as I did that, there were times when I chose to not um, make clear the way in which I was different as I got older. And and, and that can be hard. And, and, and I think that in many ways, that's easier for kids today than it was when I was going Easier to say that they're <clears throat> coming from a Lesbian different kid. kind of family. Exactly, whatever. exactly. I think um, at the time I was going through it, um, and you know, I think it was not something that was on television. It was not something that there were popular movies about. It was not something that, um, that was, was even talked about, even talked about. Yeah. correct. Um, except for my mothers wanted to talk about it because they saw every part of their life as being political and they saw being out as being very important. And so I think as a kid, there is this piece where the importance of your parents, of being who they are and being upfront with who they are kind of comes into conflict sometimes with you wanting to fit in. And that's real. It's not, it's not good or bad. It's just a real thing that you kind of have to deal with. So did you experience it as a, a kind of a worse burden at school than, than your friends had? even for other reasons? Because school is the place where people, you know, suddenly you go to a place and there's lots of kids. Right, and everybody and, wants to And fit they've in. got families, you know, that you've yeah. never heard of before. And, but there's always somebody whose family is worse or there's something more terrible about their family or whatever. Um, and, you know, gay and lesbian families came in for their share of critique from kids. Right. And that meant their kids did, which I think is why so many people were so worried about having kids to some extent. Right. It was like, well, I don't want to subject my kids to that. I, I didn't really feel that I had in any, I didn't ad, ever feel that I had the, you know, most unfortunate family to, <laughs> to you know, to, to come in. And, and, and so it wasn't so much that, I mean, it was so much more nuanced. Mm -hmm. um, I did feel like most other people's families were more like each other's than mine was. And that was not always a big problem, but it definitely was something where um, it took time and maturity, I think, to really figure out a way to bring it up um, that was um, that was genuine and was comfortable at the same time. And I think by the time I got into high school, when I did finally get around to telling people, you know, they were sort of, they were sort of uh, thought it was no big deal. You know, they, they, you know they, their response was, you know, oh, okay, moving on. <laughs> Still, though, I mean, if you go to a school that's kind of a neighborhood school, often right. your friends will come over to right. play if you're a little kid or study if you're a little bigger. Um, it's hard to keep your parents a secret. I think that was, and this I, I really changed for my brother who was seven years younger than me. But for me, I really lost some of that in between probably up until about age seven. Um, you know, all my parents who were not about to hide who they were for anybody were having all of my neighborhood friends kind of over and, <laughs> and in our childhood. And then I think there was a point where it became my choice. And I kind of got more private about that with some of my friends from school. Always had other friends that I knew from other places that, you know, I would have at home and I had tons of friends. But there was a point in that sort of elementary, in those elementary and middle school years, where I sort of probably did it less than than later my brother would, you know, in terms of having people over and, you know, mentioning kind of exactly who my family was and whatnot. Now, simultaneously, my parents were telling everybody who they were, and so <laughs> you know, it didn't always work out that that I was keeping any big secret or anything. And so it was kind of a fine. political thing for them, yes. in a way, at first. I mean, I think. Once you have a child, you go, hey, this was not a, only a political choice. Hello, this is a life and I have to raise it now. But um, when you said that not very many lesbians right. were having children, as a matter of fact, there was some uh, unfortunate critique in the lesbian community about parenting, partly because the same critique about marriage. Mm -hmm. It's like, we're, we don't want to do what they've done. We don't want to accept the rules that have been given to us, there was a lot of rejection before right. it was kind of sorted out. So it was quite a statement because right. that was way before the gaby boom. Right, <laughs> exactly. No, I think it was very much, there, there's a utopianism that was kind of, ha it was kind of going around 
in that period, you know, having just, it was not that long after, you know, Betty Friedan had published The Feminine Mystique or, you know, Stonewall or all of these things. And so there was this idea of we've thrown off the shackles, you know, and we don't want to go back into sort of this, this, um, I don't want to use the word slavery because that's, you know, hyperbolic, but that, that system. Well, it was of, pretty hyperbolic, actually. <laughs> right, all, right, all. right. Probably you, you could tell me. <laughs> uh, I think it, the over t at the beginning, I think within, and I, you know, I think having lived within the West lesbian community in some ways, there was this way in which there was a discomfort with having children. And the fact that I happened to be a boy child added an extra level yeah, of complexity. Yeah. Well, that does bring us to that. There's a yeah. famous photograph, actually, right. of you, famous in the lesbian feminist it's, community exactly. for a while. Because your mother was quite a, a well-known photographer. Correct. So uh, tell us about the West Coast Women's Music <laughs> Festival. So as you know, the West Coast Women's Music Festival was put on for <laughs> quite a few years there. And it's, you know, I think it was really a part of, in some ways, that that effort of creating a new society with new rules and, 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 and a certain a amount music. of utopianism and centered around women's music. Right. And it was really important that this be women's land. And, and for some reason, it's always that word land. Like it's not, you know, <laughs> We're on we the have land. some That's land, you know, right. like, uh, and so it was, you know, women's safe land and, you know, bringing, albeit a two year old um, male into this um, was seen as sort of a problem. Uh, by some by some members of that that community and others who wanted those people to feel comfortable. And so they came up with what to some people seemed like a compromise, which was they were going to have at the camp next door this child care where all those boy children and girl children could go, but the girl children could come back over to the main camp um, whenever they wanted, and the boy children had to stay over in in, in the uh, and holding the tank or whatever it was. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so my mother and my godmother and a bunch of their friends um, and a large number of women went over and freed, um, you all. freed us and stormed mm -hmm. the stage. And my there's a picture of my mother, you know, sort of um, topless, topless we can say this. yeah, topless uh, <laughs> with, a, I was a large kid, so a large me, kind of a, a year and a half or something sort of on her, on her hip and then sort of telling off <laughs> this entire, you know, hillside of, of women who I'm sure had every kind of variety of opinion about exactly which way this was going. I think that that debate has changed a lot. I mean, I think that, oh, no you know, this idea of, you know, the gaby boom, but also just, um, you know, that the idea that you can raise male children that can be, um, you know, if not feminist, then certainly pro-women and empowering of women. And, and, and so I see that as so much of an outgrowth of that particular time, period right. of time. And, that, right. and, and, and over time, it, it really has, has mellowed out, I believe. Well, Tia, um, tell us a little bit about your dad and um, how you got to be part of his family and um, kind of a little bit of the beginning stuff, which meant much of which you might not remember, but I bet you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, well, my dad, my dad had, had fostered kids before, so he was, he really wanted a kid, but he had taken care of kids for periods of time. And then, um, you know, I'm pretty sure it affected him because he, he, he had to let them go. You know, they weren't, they weren't his, and I think he really wanted a kid of his own. And, you know, I guess I needed a family, and yeah. um, I was five months at the time. And uh, he got me. <laughs> <laughs> he got you all right. Yeah. So uh, since you've been five months old, you've been raised by, by your dad, Michael? Mm hmm Yeah. So what's a... F Tell me in terms of what you remember early on, what it, what, uh, what it was like growing up with him. Because he would also have been a single father, right? Yeah. Um, uh, it, it really wasn't that that different for me. I mean, it wasn't weird for me. I mean, we had tons of family, like uh, friends, family friends, and uh -huh. a lot of gay men were around the house all the time. And, you know, I I, I kind of just was used to it. I grew up with them. And, you know, my when my dad would go off and work and, you know, do shows, you know, I'd be with family members, but there's big family. kind of. So did you, do you remember early on getting any feeling from friends, especially when you started school, sort of what was your experience like as a kid suddenly maybe hearing from other kids about whether your family was the normal or not? Well, I mean, from the minute I could 
talk, I knew my dad was gay. I mean, we, we talked about it, we read books about it, you know, adoption and, you know, gay adoption and, you know, me being, you know, black and him being white, you know. And um, in preschool, I mean, I went to a very liberal kind of school, hippie school. So, I mean, that wasn't a problem there. And my kindergarten, I went from kindergarten to eighth grade and there were lesbian teachers and kids who were adopted and it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. But I think um, high school, when I first got into high school, was kind of a kind of a shock to some people mm -hmm. and I was I kind of you know experienced you you felt I mean it wasn't as I wasn't as willing to say oh my dad's gay um you know I'd kind of wait till I I knew those people would really you know be around and be my friends if they liked me you know and I told them but yeah <laughs> one of the things that um there was some discussion about when Michael first adopted was that because he was HIV positive people said well is this an appropriate thing to do <laughs> Um, and now, of course, that you're older, you know this too. Um, it's sort of a difficult question, but I, uh, for, I like people to really understand what kind of what people are going through and what kind of what they face. Has this been something that ha has affected the way you think about your own life or, I don't know, him or, I don't know, something? Uh, not, not really. I mean, it, when I was younger, I, uh, about 10 or something, it kind of kind of worried me that my dad had, you know, a disease because he could he could die. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, he I only had my dad. Right. I didn't have another parent. Um, that kind of bothered me. But, you know, I've he's pretty healthy. I mean, despite all that medication he takes, you know, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, compared to a lot of my friends' parents. And, you know, he walks everywhere. You know, I don't know. He's just, um, and he's, and he's very, you know, positive. I mean, I don't think he's going to, like, I hope he doesn't die soon. Then. No, no, no. But I mean, it's yeah. the same. You're right. Is what yeah. you said about, well, I mean, other people's parents, yeah. we have these same issues. I mean, we all have friends who uh, lost their parents even in, when we were in junior high school or yeah. high school, you know, one thing or another will happen. So, um, so it, when people say, well, I don't think gay people should adopt, mm -hmm. what would you say back to them? Uh, it, it's funny that you say gay people because mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, we're all people and you, you, it kind of bothers me when people categorize other people. I mean, we're all the same race, you know, black people, white people, I and mean, we're all, I mean, really the same. And I feel, I feel as though um, it just bothers me. I mean, I feel that gay people can adopt and should adopt and will adopt. And I feel that they're as capable as anyone to be really good parents, you know, I, I <laughs> it just kind of well, seemed to be okay to me. Yeah, but yeah. you know, there's been a lot of controversy, as you know. Yeah, and they um, more than any other excuse for discrimination. Yeah, the people who hate us talk about how we shouldn't be affecting children's lives because we are affecting them somehow negatively, like being gay is catching or something. Right. Um, yeah. And I don't know if you've run into any of these kinds of attitudes, but I know you're you're aware of it. Um, do you have other other friends who've been raised by gay or lesbian parents? Yeah, I do. Do you guys ever talk about this stuff? Um, well, see, I don't really have many friends who have been raised by, you know, gay parents, but my, a lot of my friends have lesbian moms. And, um, you know, it, I don't know, I, I feel like it, we talk about, we talk about it, but, I mean, I feel like we're very, I have very positive friends and, you know, we, Prop 8 really affected us as you know kids who were you surprised been, yeah I mean my dad's not you know engaged or anything like that but I mean <laughs> if he didn't want to get married you know he couldn't what's right. really uh, but did it surprise you that the people of California I mean it was sort of a bare majority but yeah. that people would vote against us getting married mm -hmm. yeah I was you, you guys were surprised weren't you uh, yeah I found a lot it, of young people that were surprised it's kind of hurt you know it yeah. didn't really it wasn't really you know it's kind of unwrapped, you know, an Obama winning too. So it was just kind of like, oh, I know, the same night. <laughs> yeah, I know, it was better kind of like, yay! Yeah, oh yeah, no, yeah. I know. Yeah. It kind of it all came together. It was a very conflicted time. Kind of hard to believe. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Something really great happened, and then you know something didn't. So do you think uh, when the world belongs to your generation, we might do better? Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what I think too. Yeah, if you have more open-minded people and people, you know, willing to listen, and you know change their minds I feel feel like it could change <laughs> well we have you know a couple of generations in a way and of yeah. course now Emily you're a parent 
Yeah. So um, <laughs> there's a there's there's sort of a you know both ends of this going on kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Emily, tell a little of your story about uh, your your mom. Um, so I turned 39 this year, I, um, and I was uh, raised here in Los Angeles. Um, were you up in Northern California? Yeah, San Francisco. Sorry. Okay, California. so you were, and um, so my mom coming out in the early 70s. And before I was born, she, um, she was a radical feminist. And she really talks about the difference between the feminist movement at the time. It really wasn't a gay movement. Mm -hmm. She was part of the feminist movement. Mm -hmm. And there's a quote about a lot of women at that time during her process left very good husbands because it just simply wasn't compatible with the politics and the consciousness that was happening at that time. So my mom being one of those people left my dad, who was a, a very uh, good husband <laughs> as well. Um, I was two years old. And um, so I stayed very much in touch with my dad as well. I was raised, I was co-parented, um, and I had two families. I had my mom's family that was um, doing a lot of politics at the time. She opened a feminist bookstore here in LA called Sisterhood Bookstore, and I spent a lot of time as a child <laughs> and eventually working at the bookstore. Uh, that was very much a second home to me, was the bookstore. and then on the weekends and I think even when I was younger I'd actually spend half my time. My dad remarried. I was one of four children because his new wife had two children from a previous marriage. There was a lot of blending of the families happening at that time so there was a big extended family. So I would go then to being one of from an only child to being one of four children in a very traditional heterosexual um, family. And your mom, did your mom remarry? She um, ended up being in about a 10 year relationship with a woman uh -huh. from the time I was probably three years old. So she was a primary mother. So I had three mothers, <laughs> <laughs> my stepmother and then my mother and then um, her partner as well at the time. And it was similar to what you were talking about. Everything was very political. And it wasn't, there was a lot of focus on um, the adults and the community, but not a lot on the children. And for my mom, she had a very difficult time integrating um, me into that world because not a lot of the women had children at that time. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of meetings and a lot of consciousness raising groups and a lot of political actions. And at the same time, there was this idea, well, how do we fit this child growing up into this world? And what ended up happening is I ended up just kind of being dragged along mm -hmm. and Fortunately, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> I didn't have, I wasn't resistant to it, but I could see that being very challenging if a child was, was resistant to it. So that fortunately worked out very well, which was really different than my dad's family because, you know, we, they were just a very traditional family and we would watch TV in the evenings and have dinner and, and just do very kind of traditional things. So constantly I was faced uh, with a contrast of, of these two families. And I think that was very hard for me to develop a very strong sense of self because I, I felt kind of pulled in, in different directions. And um, definitely at school, it was hard to talk about the family that, that I came from. And what then further complicated things is I came out myself at a very young age. Mm -hmm. And the joke I have with my mom now is when I 
disclosed to her that I felt like I was a lesbian as well, she told me I was just going through a phase. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, it could so, be. And it's been a long you know. phase. But, <laughs> it's been a long um, phase, is right. And you have a partner now. So, yes. And we got married during the window period when the Supreme Court approved our marriages just before the Prop 8 came down. So we're one of the 18,000 couples, I think, in California that has a, a marriage license from the state. Um, and then we had our son uh, two years ago in October. And it's, it's very interesting now looking at things um, as, as a mother as opposed to a child raising him in, a, in this community as well. And also having him be male is, you know, adds a whole other element to gender and sexuality and how, how these things come together. Um, we have a known donor and so his father is, is very involved. And so, you know, he's, we think a very fortunate child. He has two moms and a dad eight grandparents. <laughs> uh, he just has huge fan club. And he's thriving. I think that... Hey, the more presence, yeah, the better. I, you know, <laughs> I, that's what they know for at least at right. that age. And the, the love and the attention that is showered on him constantly. Um, you know, he's a really amazingly independent and strong-willed little guy. So different than how I remember myself because at his age. When you were younger, it was difficult for you because you had trouble talking, or not trouble, but you didn't want to talk about your family, just your mom's family, so you would talk about your dad's family because that was the normal one. Yeah, I think, though, I didn't really want to even bring up the subject of family because mm -hmm. if I talked about my dad, there would be the question of, well, where's your mom? And so then that would sort of lead into... And it also, it seemed it was it was complicated. I would say, well, I have, you know, a mom and her partner and a dad and a stepmom and a stepbrother. And it was still, there were divorces happening and remarriages. And, but it, it felt like in the 70s, it was somewhat unusual to sort of have these blended families. And I think more so then that it was unusual than it is So now. you were... I mean, it sounds like. But you know what was also. He is the only one here that didn't have to keep secrets. That's cool. <laughs> is that? And I mean, that's yeah. It was. I, it was. Also difficult because, I came out when I was really young, and I was worried that people were going to say, that your mother made you gay. I was very aware of that stigma, and I was. I knew that that was something a, cri a critique of lesbians having children, and I didn't want to perpetuate that by mm -hmm. coming out myself. So what do you think of that theory? Um, well, I think that unfortunately, the premise that sort of assumes that there's something wrong with being gay in the first place. And so that in of itself is bothersome. And I think that, you know, we had just such a wonderful opportunity to see that there's so many different families. And we, I mean, for myself, so many people who are older and come from heterosexual families, it took them a really long time to figure things out. But then when they look back on their childhood, they say, of course, but they didn't, that they were gay, but they didn't have a language. They didn't have an understanding. And we had all of that. So mm -hmm. I think we just, sorry, I'm speaking mm -hmm. for you as well, right. um, that, that we had an, an opportunity to understand ourselves. Um, but it was lonely for you in, in a thing. different way. I, I mean, was I knew extremely you when you were lonely a kid because yeah. I rented the house in back of your mom's house, right. which is where I'm living right now. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's a wonderful circle. I think it is. Um, but you were very quiet. I mean, I didn't. I was painfully shy and mm -hmm. painfully self-conscious, and it took a really long time to um, really come into my own. Not until my twenties, I would say. So how do you think it's going to be for Lucas? I see him as having such a different experience. I mean, already I can see it. Just, I think a lot of it is just who he is. Mm -hmm. And I think just the environment that he's growing up in. I mean, he's just, he's an amazing 
innately confident little guy. So I don't see him. I And I also, it's uh, reassuring to hear pe people's experiences that are younger now, that are growing up, that have very different experiences. I think that being a child now in a gay family, because, you know, our parents were sort of the, the trendsetters, and now we have had the gayby boom, and I just think it's a really different time Well, right I'll tell now. you, from my generation, which is yet again, you know, one removed, um, it was a real loss to us that we never thought, if we weren't married, and we thought we might be gay or we be gay from a young age, we never thought kids could be part of it. Right. Didn't have, even the technology was, if it existed, was so expensive, you couldn't even think about it. Mm -hmm. right. um, and to keep the secret and to wonder, should we do that to a kid? So there are a lot of my cohort who, if they were not married and had kids while they were married, right. never had kids. And, you know, you get to a place where you live with your life and you think, okay, that's the way it is, you know, lots of other people's kids in my life. But it was a sacrifice um, in a way. I, I, you're talking about your mom sort of making this choice and a lot of other people being critical. Mm -hmm. But um, I think a lot of just regular people who were not incredibly political were just scared and, you know, couldn't figure out how could you have a family? So you get to the point, you know, in your 50s and 60s and think, you know, hell, I could have been a grandmother by now, but now I, you know, that was not in the cards. Sort of the in the cards piece of it, I think, is the interesting thing here. Right. Well, I think also for both of us, certainly back then to, to be a woman, to be a lesbian who decided to have kids or had kids and decided to really... Um, bring those kids into the lesbian community. Mm -hmm. That was a political act then. And of course, there have always been lesbians. There's always been and, and gay men, and, and they've always raised kids. Um, the issue is that to do it openly in the 70s and early 80s, I think, was a political act. Um, and I think now, to some extent, that's still true. But a lot more people don't have to be activists. You don't have to be a, a radical left-wing activist and be a lesbian with kids. You can be a Republican woman and have, you know, and you and your Republican wife can go have kids <laughs> and raise them in places not like San Francisco or the west side of Los Angeles. Um, and I think that's changing a lot. And, I, you know, to the extent that people do hear my story and don't necessarily see their reality in it, I, I you know, I'm very cognizant of that, 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 you know, there's plenty of people who just live in a, a typical suburban house and, you know, go to the neighborhood big public high school and, you know, and that's their reality. I think more of the people who did it early had to do it in a very intentional and political way. Well, there's also the coming out process. I right. mean, a lot of times when, you know, as gay or lesbian people talk about coming out, it's like about them and you choose the person and then the next person that you're going to tell, etc. But it, it never occurs to us that our parents have to come out when we come out, our kids have to come out, right. you know, if we're open or if we're suddenly being open. I mean, you, Tia, you were saying, well, then I went to high school. Not that you're saying, oh, it's horrible, but it was a, it was a process for you. Uh, yeah, I mean, and plus I was around new people. I mean, I had been with a lot of the kids. My school, there were nine kids in my graduating class, and I know right. them since kindergarten. So... Uh, it was it was just a whole it's a whole new world I guess as it were I mean and uh, now I'm really open with them because I'm I'm a sophomore and I don't care who knows anything but um, <laughs> freshman I'm, I'm, I was new and you know new teachers new new environment and plus you know there are a lot of kids in my in my school in my grade who are out and you know like you know want to know more about my family because they think you know they can adopt kids and stuff too so I think that's kind of right kind of helps. So it's sort of like a, a role model. I guess kind, kind of. of well, I mean, I, I think we, yeah. we un serve these unexpected purposes sometimes in our <laughs> lives. You yeah. don't set out to be a role model, but your life kind of is an example. Um, do they have parent stuff at your school? Like parent-teacher meetings? Yeah, like, yeah. no, I mean, well, yeah. parent-teacher meetings, yeah. I mean, <laughs> but in addition, do parents participate in stuff so many schools now have to have fundraisers you know in order to exist but. yeah um we do theater festivals and stuff you know my dad drives kids and you know brings snacks and stuff so 
Yeah, and my friends <laughs> love my dad. You know, I, <laughs> What's not to love with Michael Kearns, that's what I say. But. Yeah. But I do think, picking up on that, there's a point where all of a sudden it seems to switch in sort of high school and certainly in college. You go to a you know, small liberal arts college on the East Coast like I did, and all of a sudden your parents, you get sort of whipsawed because all of a sudden you're cool because your parents are lesbians. Oh, I know. And yeah, like, definitely. that feels in some ways as weird <laughs> as when you were kind of keeping it a secret because, you know, you don't want to be identified. I don't think, I think this is, this is for all kids. You don't really want to be cool or not cool because of your parents. <laughs> You know, you, you, just under the radar. You know that your parents are not cool <laughs> for you, so you kind of don't want them to be the people that are kind of deciding. And so I think there is this point where you sort of realize that that's sort of a universal thing, and that you just have this added thing. But sure, I mean, I tell you, every time in college when people found out, you know, people wanted to sit and have a long, interesting conversation oh, yeah. with me about it. <laughs> and, you know, just at a point, you're just okay. Here's yeah. here's the here are the bullet points. Call <laughs> me when you finish reading them. Yeah. And and then the flip side for me is. When I had with my lesbian friends, they thought it was the coolest thing to have a lesbian mother. And they thought, oh, you're so lucky and right. how wonderful and how great. And yes, it was all those things. But then there was not the same recognition that there were challenges to having lesbian moms as well. So there were sort of all, all different aspects of it happening. So is there anything that you would identify that's really a, a pretty serious downside to having gay or lesbian parents. I mean, we were very careful to point out always that there's nothing wrong with the parents. Two people love each other, they wanna have a kid. But that the, the problem is with society. But like anything else, you know, kids suffer in society for who their parents are or whatever. And I think really there was an underlying feeling that there's a big question about whether this community, or at least there was, should have kids, could raise them regular enough that they would be all right. What do you think? I mean, seriously, think about it. What do you think? Hard things about this? Mm. Well, I think, I think there's the pressure on the kid, and then there's actually the pressure on the family. And... I think definitely, as was kind of shown in some ways in the in the movie, uh, in the recent movie, uh, the, I think there were times where certain of my mothers were, you know, felt somewhat insecure in their role in the family because of their legal rights um, were not there because there um, were four mothers. I mean, you know, there's just a lot of competition for the title of mother. Um, and I think that that had pressure on relationships all around. Um, again, it gets back to a problem with society. And, and, and I think that that is getting clearer. Legal rights are getting more clearly spelled out. And, but I think certainly when I was young, um, there was a real, there was a real focus. I mean, people were not doing much of the knowing the donor, um, right. because they, were intensely worried that this man, you know, um, would come back and sort of rip their family apart. And I think when I saw the movie, I thought, on the one hand, that's very a very real um, uh, issue that has been around, at least was around earlier. But on the other hand, I kind of felt it was, while it made it created a dramatic energy in the in the movie. I felt like it was sort of unfortunate because I wasn't very aware of that being a real issue. Um, but Carl, is some of it language? I mean, you had two parents and a donor. Right. You know, donor sounds like you got a pint of blood or something. Well, probably pretty much did. a little less, yeah, actually. Right. Um, yeah. And it, but your curiosity was never piqued about it. For me, it wasn't. Um, you know, I was. Um, I was so intensely wanted that the idea of going finding this person, you know, that really played not much, not really any role in my life um, other than genetics, um, was not something that I spent much time thinking about. Um, and I think there's always been a lot of other people wanting me to want to go find this person. <laughs> um, for me, it really it goes as far as it, you know, being curious about you know some ethnic background that I may have that I don't know about or um, perhaps, you know, 
a curiosity about some sort of medical you know thing I need to look at. But those are very you know tangential to who I am as a person. It's interesting because in our decision to have a child, we were very intentional about wanting our child to have the opportunity to know mm -hmm. um, who their His father biological was. father. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we felt like we did not want our child to grow up wondering, and which you're sort of saying you didn't anyway. So it's interesting. We thought that we were really doing this as something for our child, mm -hmm. that we wanted to give him the opportunity to know everything about um, you know, his biology. And then not only his biological connection, but the fact that we now have, he's now part of our family. So, you know, we just keep creating a bigger and larger But that family. must be interesting too, because we're so used to there being, well, a single parent, okay, we can live with that. <laughs> Two parents is like the regular thing. Right. Three parents, no. We, we, you know, we're not, uh, in a science fiction book here, you know, where we're on another planet with this. So how how do you handle, and, I don't know. And we, even, we had this talk, Emily, right. and you know, there are some And we're, every day, issues. we're figuring it out. I mean, that's the thing, because there's no model out there, we're just left to just figure it out on a daily basis. And I think even in terms of, I'm very cognizant of it, mostly when reading books, to Lucas, that's what's interesting, because even now there are many, there are books of children in gay families, but those children either have two moms, two dads, or a single gay mom or dad. So I think we now have to actually write a new book <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is a child that has two moms and a dad, because I think it's actually happening now more, it's, it's becoming more common that People are choosing to have known donors and have mm -hmm. them involved to a, to many different degrees. I think some people are choosing to have a known donor, but someone who lives in another state or another town, whereas Lucas's father lives a mile away. So we see but him quite a bit. But he doesn't have any legal rights, right? Correct. He has so zero legal rights. We have Drew rights. on the show someday and ask him, how do you feel about that? Right. But but he has a very independent relationship with Lucas. Right. He has his own relationship that has nothing to do with with myself or with Stacy. And it's a real lesson in letting go of control for us because he is going to have a completely separate and already does. I mean, even from a very right from the start, he had his own very unique um, relationship with him that has nothing to do with us. And uh, it's it's a very interesting way to parent mm -hmm. in a way, because here's this third parent who is part of the family, but not part of the family, is his father, but has no legal rights to him. And so it's it, 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 it feels like we're really sort of entering very new territory. And as Lucas gets older, it'll be interesting to see how things well, continue books, to progress. Uh, in a way, it's funny how we use books to explain things. You were saying that yeah. uh, Michael gave you books to read, and it was not only about a gay parent, but also about adoption. Adoption, right. But going back to, you know, your birth family, I mean, I, I asked my dad, you know, if I had any birth siblings or who my birth mom was, and my dad was very, you know, honest with me. And he said, you know, you have birth siblings and you have a mom. And I met her. And I met my birth siblings. And, you know, I think that once was enough for me. And I kind of don't need to see them again or, you know. But I, I feel like, you know, now they kind of want to be part of my life. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's kind of, that's the, the hard thing for me, being, you know, connected or disconnected from the birth family. Mm -hmm. so. But it, it's interesting he left it up to you in a way, I think. Yeah. And that, I think, is a, a, a what it really comes down to for, for all of us because you make choices for your children until there's a point where they're making some for themselves. Yeah. And I mean, still, when you're in your 30s, you're still making you know choices about what you want to tell who and how you want to characterize your own history. Um, so are you worried about kids growing up in gay families at all? Yeah. Do you think we're better? 
No, I just feel I just feel like me growing up for myself, I'm just more aware of the world and, you know, more open and I and I feel that um if I probably didn't have a gay dad, I, I wouldn't be, you know, as open to the idea of, you know, gay families or, you know, I, I probably would, but I mean, it'd be different. I mean, I wouldn't be as aware of the world. So when you say aware and open, do you mean, um, uh, let me expand it a little bit. Yeah. Do you mean kind of only on these issues or do you think it gives mm -hmm. you more of a sensitivity about other people in their families. Yeah, everything. I, I, I truly feel because I um I see where other people are coming from and you know how different families are and you know it's just not it you know me having a single you know gay dad isn't as bizarre as you know my neighbors or something you know I feel <laughs> uh -huh. I feel like we're all different and we should embrace our uniqueness in our, in our families. How about you, Carl? Do you think? I th I I don't think that. On it on its own that that gays or lesbians are better parents. I think I think wanted children have a better upbringing. Yeah, and um, that touches on a lot of different issues. Um, and I think it's something that we're getting better at as a society of um, moving towards you know children really being wanted and celebrated and 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 I think that can only be good. Um, but and not only wanted but very intentional. Yes. And oftentimes having to a lot of, to work very hard at creating this family, whether it's um, you know figuring out how you're gonna you're gonna use donor sperm mm -hmm. or known sperm, mm -hmm. and you know it, it can be very costly. But we don't have very many accidental There's pregnancies. There's no accidents. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. exactly. <laughs> and I think that also along with one sexuality, there's so many other factors involved of parenting, including it seems, I think this is less so now because younger gay people are actually are now thinking about having children, but it seems that not too long ago, it was women who were older than the traditional uh, parents mm -hmm. at the time. And so there is something I think to be said for uh, women who are a little more mature and are further along in their careers and are financially stable. And I think that that really goes a long way to um, having skills and resources to be able to parent because it's, as I'm learning, you know, an incredibly challenging, you know, and, and wonderful job, but it's, it's a lot of work. And, uh, you know, a single person, I mean, I can't even, I, you know, I need a whole village <laughs> to assist me in this process. So I, I think there is a lot to be said about in, intention um, to parenting and, and really wanting mm -hmm. that child, I think. Well, it sounds like there's a kind of a balance or a tension because what I picked up from, um, not only from you, Emily, but I think especially, and, and the fact that you're the secretness of it, which is isolating in a way, mm -hmm. uh, not so much in your, maybe in your generation or just in your life, Tia, but the, the, the fact of not being able to talk about your parents or not feeling like you can, sort of balanced with the notion that they really wanted me, they really, they mm -hmm. like me, they really like me, you know. Um, it's, uh, it, it's a sort of, it's, it's a lot of weight in a way on a kid to think about this. It's not just looking like, you know, the TV series, although it's looking more and more like Modern Family, right. there's no question. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Right. But um, I guess the, the, the point of this in a way is not just to say, well, we're all right, because we could have said at the beginning in a <laughs> minute, but really as a message to anybody uh, in society watching the show, um, what advice first of all, would you give to kids growing up now with gay parents? Now, I feel like they should be giving me advice. It's such a different environment uh, yeah. that kids are growing up in. Well, now, maybe just, in LA, but maybe not right. so much in Horses Breath, California or right. Kansas, yeah. you know. We definitely live in a bubble here. <laughs> to some extent. In Los Angeles in that regard. I, I do think it's simpler than it feels like it is at some times. Um, 
you know, there's there's prejudice everywhere, and sometimes there's more prejudice on the playgrounds of San Francisco than maybe in Horses Breath, um, um, California. But I, I I do feel that on the one hand, you know, the the piece that goes back to some early pioneers and sort of gay liberation and everything else is, you know, coming out. It feels really scary before you do it, and then and then um, and then you do it, and it's not nearly as big a deal as you think it is. Uh, that's that's almost always in my experience the case. Um, so so having courage um, is is still probably something that most often is the advice I would have. Um, but I also think that there's a piece where, um, depending on your parents, I, I think you have a right to also have a certain say in the way that you want to present yourself in the world, and that that right changes at stages over your life, and you should feel comfortable. Um, having a certain amount of say in that as a kid. And, um, you know, that doesn't mean your parents have to pretend to be a straight couple, but it does mean you get to have some say. And I think having that conversation with your parents from a very early age is probably a pretty healthy thing. Um, and it's something that I don't think I really got around to exactly having literally <laughs> with my parents um, until much later than probably would have been helpful. And sometimes it's just hard to talk to your parents, regardless right. of what the issue right. is. Right. So it's and, always hard to talk yeah. to your parents, regardless of what the issue is. Yeah. Yeah. As much as we now, as a parent, really, you know, my hope is to have a different relationship with our son, and that he will want to talk to us. But you know, probably all parents wish that as well. And yeah, wait till he's fourteen. Yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> then I'll probably not even want to speak to him <laughs> either. But. You know, for us, we <clears throat> we are very intentional about wanting to expose him to so much in life in terms of different families and different cultures. And, you know, we want to travel and see different things in the world. And our hope is that for him to really see all and appreciate, kind of like what Tia was talking about, just to really have a appreciation for diversity and for difference. And you know, Lucas, he has gay people in his family and he has straight people in his family and just, and young people, we live, uh, where we live, we have four generations. Hmm. My, so we have 94 years old all the way down to two. Um, so I think we just are, are very intentional about wanting to broaden his exposure and his horizons to, to the greatest extent and then just cross our fingers and hope for the best <laughs> this is all, all that, that all that one can it. do right well you know it's interesting when you said you're an actor and that is your uh, your focus in school and i assume beyond school um from what i remember of being an actor it's a very very important thing to understand other people's lives because you're going to be being them so do, it, has that played any um sort of any role in kind of helping you to be able to be someone else when you work? Um, yeah, and plus I'm just a really understanding person, kind of I, too much for my own good, I guess. Um, but um, yeah, it, it has, because being exposed to what I've been exposed to, um, all these different cultures and people and, and ways of living um, has really helped me, you know, with what I, what I love to do and, you know, I, I act and, I can apply different things from what I've seen and, you know, felt and be these characters. And you could probably play a white gay man very, very <laughs> perfectly. <laughs> I'm working on that. Well, if, if Michael could play an African-American woman, I would have seen him do, you know? Yeah. I mean, why not? Yeah. Well, it is interesting when kids, when, when kids are exposed to, uh, I won't say just lack of intolerance or, or being tolerant, but really such a variety of lies. My, my own experience in high school uh, in Los Angeles, our class was, it was one of those neighborhoods that I guess the, the people would say was changing, uh, the way they refer to it, but it was one third black, one third white, and one third Asian in my high school. And we actually had our 50th high school reunion not too long ago. Um, and we had all bunch of us there, and we were talking about how impactful that was on our lives in ways that we had no idea, because we weren't having tension in the school. It wasn't necessarily always all mixed up at lunchtime, you know, but 
simply the fact of knowing other people's families, other people's lives, other people's food. You know, I mean, it was it was quite extraordinary to to know. And in that sense, I think we also become an object lesson for other kids in a mm -hmm. funny way as the children of gay or lesbian parents mm -hmm. um, in a way that we don't really know, that they're learning from us. If you had anyone, I don't know, I haven't asked you this question, so you might not be able to think of it, but anyone ever say to you, I was so glad to know you because I would have never met uh, um, parents like yours or people and it kind of made me think, or I, I don't know, anything like that. I see you nodding, but... Mm, no, <laughs> not really. I mean, they like my family because we're different. I mean, I'm black and my dad's white. I think I think that's the thing that shocks most people. Uh -huh. I think that he's a single dad and he's white and I'm black and right. a girl too. But I think is diff I think that's different because I mean, people don't really care about the gay thing. I guess. Interesting. Yeah. Well, race is the big discussion in America. Yeah. There's really no question. But, and that's also, I think, maybe an experience that they will look back later and go, whoa, that was really a learning experience for me. You know? <laughs> yeah. I think it's been more for me, um, and this is actually, I think, in some ways lessening, where um, they somebody has a lesbian couple friend that's thinking about having a kid and they like want to like find <laughs> us at a party and put us next to each other so I can <laughs> tell them how to do it or something. I don't, you know. um, and I think that's lessening just because they're starting to know so many people that I'm not the first person they meet anymore that that you know has gone through that. Um, I don't know. I mean, is that right? I, I, I think the flip side, I think the other part is that um, you know, figuring out being gay or not, you know, figuring out a family that works for you, that that where people are supported, where, you know, economically it works, where you can raise the kids the way you want to, is something that all families are, have to figure out. And um, I think more and more I see, you know, straight couples who are, or straight single people who are, you know, trying to figure out that they can sort of do it in a way that works for them. And that, you know, if, if a woman, you know, wants to have a kid and you know, she's getting on into her 30s. She doesn't have to just give up on that dream. And, you know, I th I'm starting to see that. And, and I think that's probably the best lesson of all that, that, again, getting back to this theme of, you know, it's most important the children are wanted. And, and you know, sort of that's, that's what's going to happen and, and make, make great children. I think that's sort of moving out into the broader society. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you all three for telling your stories and, uh, being here and you know sharing and thank you for being with us too. Um, so just remember the kids are all right. So get used to it. <coughs>